Harmony OS is about to revolutionize the way we use PCs, and I'm going to show you exactly how it's doing it. Huawei's Harmony OS has been making waves in the tech world, and for good reason. As we move forward in this digital age, our devices are becoming increasingly interconnected, and Harmony OS is at the forefront of this revolution. By creating an operating system that can seamlessly integrate across devices, Huawei is changing the game for the PC industry. And in this video, we're going to dive into exactly what that means and how it's going to impact the way we use our devices. In a world where we're constantly switching between our computers, smartphones and tablets, Harmony OS is going to make our lives a whole lot easier. No more tedious file transfers or lost documents. No more worrying about whether your devices are compatible. Harmony OS is going to make it all just work effortlessly and efficiently. And that's not all with its microkernel architecture. Harmony OS is going to bring a level of performance and security to our devices that we've never seen before. But Harmony OS isn't just about making our lives easier, it's about opening up new possibilities. Imagine being able to use your smartphone as a fully-fledged computer or being able to seamlessly switch between devices without ever having to worry about compatibility issues. That's the world that Harmony OS is promising, and it's an exciting one. And as we'll see later in this video, Harmony OS is already making a significant impact on the tech industry. So what exactly is Harmony OS, and how does it work? We'll get into the nitty-gritty of it all in just a minute, but for now, let's just say that it's an operating system that's designed to be fast, efficient, and above all, flexible. Whether you're using a smartphone, a tablet, or a computer, Harmony OS is going to make your device work harder and smarter for you. Traditional PC operating systems have been stuck in a rut for years, and it's about time someone shook things up. For too long, we've been forced to deal with slow boot times, clunky interfaces, and outdated software. But with Harmony OS, those days are behind us. This is an operating system that's designed for the modern world, and it shows. We've all been there stuck with a slow computer that just can't keep up with our demands. But what if I told you that those days were behind us? What if I told you that there was an operating system out there that could breathe new life into even the oldest of devices? That operating system is Harmony OS, and it's going to change the way we think about our devices forever. Gone are the days of tedious software updates and security patches. Gone are the days of slow performance and clunky interfaces. With Harmony OS, we're entering a new era of computing, one where our devices are fast, efficient, and above all, secure. But what about compatibility issues? What about all the different devices and platforms out there? Doesn't Harmony OS just add to the confusion? The answer is no. Harmony OS is designed to be flexible, to work with any device, no matter the platform. Whether you're using a Huawei phone or a Samsung tablet, Harmony OS is going to make it all just work. One of the biggest problems with traditional PC operating systems is that they're just not designed for the modern world. Are you enjoying the video? If yes, please subscribe, like and share our videos. For more updated and exciting content, let's continue. Traditional PCs OS are clunky, outdated and above all slow. But Harmony OS is different. This is an operating system that's designed for speed, for efficiency, and for flexibility. But it's not just about speed and performance, it's about security too. We've all heard the horror stories about malware and viruses, about hackers and data breaches. But with Harmony OS, those days are behind us. This is an operating system that's designed with security in mind from the ground up. So what exactly makes Harmony OS so special? 4. Starters, it's designed to be highly adaptable, to work seamlessly across devices and platforms. It's also designed to be highly efficient, to make the most of your device's resources. And above all, it's designed to be highly secure, to keep your data safe from prying eyes. But it's not just about the technology behind Harmony OS, it's about the impact it's going to have on the tech industry. As more and more devices start to run Harmony OS, we're going to see a fundamental shift in the way we use our devices. Imagine being able to use your smartphone as a fully-fledged computer, complete with a keyboard and mouse. Imagine being able to seamlessly switch between devices without ever having to worry about compatibility issues. That's the world that Harmony OS is promising, and it's a world that's just around the corner, and Harmony OS isn't just limited to Huawei devices either. As more and more manufacturers start to adopt the operating system, we're going to see a whole new range of devices that are faster, more efficient, and more secure. But what about the features? What about the things that really set Harmony OS apart from traditional PC operating systems? Well, for starters, there's the whole concept of seamless integration across devices. With Harmony OS, you can start something on one device and pick it up exactly where you left off on another. 
And then there's the performance. Harmony OS is designed to be fast, to make the most of your device's resources. Whether you're using a smartphone, a tablet, or a computer, Harmony OS is going to make it all just work effortlessly and efficiently. But it's not just about the features, it's about the impact it's going to have on the tech industry. As more and more devices start to run Harmony OS, we're going to see a fundamental shift in the way we use our devices that really made waves in the tech world. Suddenly, Harmony OS was more than just a pipe dream. It was a real, tangible operating system that was going to change the game. And let's not forget about the microkernel architecture that makes Harmony OS so fast and efficient. This is an operating system that's designed to be highly adaptable, to work seamlessly across devices and platforms. But what really sets Harmony OS apart is its ability to seamlessly integrate across devices. Whether you're using a smartphone, a tablet, or a computer, Harmony OS is going to make it all just work effortlessly and efficiently. And with its partnerships with major hardware manufacturers, Harmony OS is going to be everywhere. It's going to be on your smartphone, your tablet, your computer, and even your smart TV. In short, Harmony OS is changing the game for the PC industry, and it's doing it in a big way. Whether you're a tech enthusiast or just someone who likes to stay ahead of the curve, Harmony OS is going to... Microsoft Windows with its widespread adoption and Apple's Mac OS, known for its user friendliness and design aesthetics, have long dominated the landscape. But the tech world is no stranger to disruption. Remember the rise of mobile operating systems like Android and iOS? They reshaped the way we interact with technology. Now a new contender emerges from the East, aiming to challenge the status quo. Huawei's Harmony OS, unveiled in 2019, is not just another mobile OS. It aspires to be a universal operating system, capable of powering everything from smartphones and tablets to smart TVs, wearables, and even cars. The ambition is grand to create a seamless, interconnected ecosystem where devices communicate effortlessly and users enjoy a unified experience across all their gadgets. But can Harmony OS truly break the grip of the established giants? Can it overcome the hurdles of software development, market adoption, and geopolitical tensions? The answers lie in understanding Harmony OS's unique features, its potential benefits for users, and the challenges it must navigate. This video will delve into the core of Harmony OS, comparing it with its well-entrenched rivals and assessing its potential to spark the next OS revolution. The journey promises to be fascinating as we witness a new player attempting to redefine the rules of the game in the ever-evolving world of personal computing. Born out of necessity, Harmony OS was initially conceived as Huawei's response to potential restrictions on using Android. However, it quickly evolved into something much grander. Olivia, what do you think about Harmony OS for PCs? Thank you, Victor. Harmony OS is designed to be a micro-kernel-based distributed operating system, a fundamental departure from the monolithic architectures of Windows and Mac OS. This distributed approach allows Harmony OS to run seamlessly across a wide range of devices, adapting its functionality based on the hardware capabilities of each device. At its core, Harmony OS emphasizes interconnectivity and resource sharing. Imagine a scenario where your smartphone seamlessly connects to your tablet, allowing you to start a task on one device and seamlessly continue it on another. Or picture your smart TV instantly accessing files from your laptop without complex network configurations. Harmony OS aims to make these scenarios effortless, blurring the lines between individual devices and creating a unified digital experience. The development of Harmony OS has been rapid, with Huawei investing heavily in its growth. From its initial release on smart TVs, Harmony OS has expanded to power smartphones, tablets, wearables, and even in-car systems. This rapid expansion demonstrates Huawei's commitment to establishing Harmony OS as a comprehensive ecosystem, challenging the dominance of Android in the East and potentially making inroads globally. The future of Harmony OS hinges on its ability to attract developers, foster a vibrant app ecosystem, and gain widespread adoption among users. The journey is fraught with challenges, but the potential rewards are enormous. How does Harmony OS stack up against the reigning champions of the OS world? Microsoft Windows and Apple's Mac OS While direct comparisons can be tricky given Harmony OS's broader device focus, certain key aspects offer insights. In terms of user interface, 
Harmony OS adopts a clean, minimalist design philosophy, prioritizing ease of navigation and intuitive interactions. This approach shares similarities with Mac OS's focus on user experience, while differing from Windows' more traditional, albeit increasingly modern, interface. One of Harmony OS's standout features is its distributed file system. Unlike Windows and Mac OS, where files are typically confined to a single device, Harmony OS allows devices to seamlessly access and share files across the entire ecosystem. Imagine starting a document on your smartphone and effortlessly continuing it on your laptop, with the file seamlessly transferring between devices. This interconnected approach aims to streamline workflows and enhance productivity. Harmony OS also boasts robust security features, leveraging microkernel architecture and distributed security mechanisms. This distributed security model is designed to isolate different components of the system, making it more resilient to attacks. While Windows and Mac OS have also made significant strides in security, Harmony OS's approach presents a novel perspective on safeguarding user data and privacy in an increasingly interconnected world. The challenge for Harmony OS lies in convincing users and developers that its security model is robust and trustworthy. Timothy, please your thoughts on Harmony OS for PCs. Thanks, Olivia. Harmony OS has the potential to disrupt the OS landscape, but its path is fraught with challenges. One major hurdle is app availability. A thriving app ecosystem is crucial for any operating system success. While Huawei has been actively courting developers, encouraging them to build apps for Harmony OS, it faces an uphill battle against the established app libraries of Android and iOS. Convincing developers to invest time and resources in a new platform requires demonstrating Harmony OS's unique capabilities and its potential for future growth. Market adoption presents another significant challenge. While Harmony OS has gained traction in China, its global reach remains limited. Breaking into Western markets where Windows and Mac OS are deeply entrenched necessitates overcoming not only technical hurdles, but also geopolitical considerations. Huawei's ongoing tensions with certain Western governments could create obstacles for Harmony OS's adoption in those regions. Despite the challenges, Harmony OS offers a compelling value proposition, a unified, interconnected experience across devices. This resonates with the growing trend of users owning multiple devices and seeking seamless integration between them. Harmony OS's potential to streamline workflows, enhance productivity, and simplify cross-device interactions could be a major draw for users seeking a more cohesive digital life. Section 5. A glimpse into the future. Harmony's potential impact, the future of Harmony. OS is brimming with possibilities, but its ultimate impact hinges on several factors. If Harmony OS successfully navigates the challenges of app development, market adoption, and geopolitical hurdles, it could reshape the way we interact with technology. Imagine a world where your smartphone seamlessly integrates with your car's infotainment system, your smartwatch effortlessly controls your home appliances, and your tablet becomes an extension of your laptop, all powered by a single, unified operating system. Harmony OS's distributed architecture opens doors for innovative user experiences. Imagine collaborative work scenarios where multiple users can simultaneously interact with a single document or presentation, seamlessly sharing edits and ideas across devices, or envision immersive gaming experiences where the boundaries between virtual and real-world blur, with smartphones, wearables and smart TVs working in concert to create a truly engaging environment. However, Realizing these possibilities requires overcoming significant hurdles. Competing against established giants like Microsoft and Apple is no small feat. Building a robust app ecosystem, gaining user trust, and navigating geopolitical complexities are all crucial for Harmony OS to achieve its full potential. The journey ahead is challenging, but the potential rewards are substantial. Harmony OS represents a bold vision for the future of operating systems, one that prioritizes interconnectivity, seamless integration, and a unified user experience across the ever-expanding digital landscape. Your thoughts, Vivian. Please uh, start from Section 6. Thanks, Timothy. Section 6. Seamless Integration. A cornerstone of Harmony. OS. One of Harmony OS's defining characteristics is its commitment to seamless integration. The operating system is designed to break down the barriers between devices, allowing them to communicate and share resources effortlessly. 
This vision extends beyond simple file sharing, encompassing a more holistic approach to device interaction. Imagine initiating a video call on your smartphone and seamlessly transferring it to your smart TV for a larger viewing experience, all with a simple gesture. Harmony OS aims to make these scenarios the norm, blurring the lines between individual devices and fostering a truly interconnected digital ecosystem. The seamless integration extends to user experiences as well. Harmony OS's distributed architecture allows for a consistent user interface and functionality across different devices. This means that regardless of whether you're using a smartphone, a tablet, or a smart TV, the core interactions and design language remain familiar and intuitive. This unified approach simplifies the user experience, eliminating the need to learn different interfaces and navigate disparate ecosystems. Harmony OS's commitment to seamless integration has profound implications for productivity and efficiency. By facilitating effortless data transfer, resource sharing, and cross-device collaboration, Harmony OS empowers users to streamline their workflows and accomplish tasks more effectively. Imagine starting a presentation on your laptop, seamlessly transferring it to your tablet for a mobile review, and finally presenting it on a large screen using your smart TV all within a single unified environment. This level of integration has the potential to revolutionize the way we work, learn, and interact with technology. Section 7. Performance and Efficiency. Harmony OS Under the Hood. Harmony OS's microkernel architecture is designed to deliver a balance of performance and efficiency. Unlike the monolithic kernels of Windows and Mac OS, which manage all system resources within a single large structure. Harmony OS's microkernel only handles the most essential functions, delegating other tasks to smaller, specialized modules. This modular approach offers several advantages. It allows for greater flexibility in resource allocation, enabling the operating system to adapt its performance based on the specific requirements of each device and application. The microkernel architecture also contributes to enhanced security and stability. By isolating different components of the system, the impact of any potential errors or vulnerabilities is minimized. If one module encounters a problem, it's less likely to affect other parts of the system, leading to a more resilient and reliable operating experience. This modular approach also simplifies the process of updating and maintaining the operating system as individual modules can be updated independently without requiring a full system reboot. Harmony OS's focus on efficiency extends beyond its core architecture. The operating system incorporates various optimization techniques to minimize resource consumption and extend battery life, particularly important for mobile devices. These optimizations range from intelligent power management algorithms to background process limitations, ensuring that Harmony OS devices can operate smoothly and efficiently, even under demanding conditions. This commitment to performance and efficiency is crucial for Harmony OS's success, especially as it targets a wide range of devices, from resource-constrained wearables to power-hungry smart TVs. Timmy, your thoughts. Please take it up, Form Section 8. Thanks, Vivian. Section 8. Security and Privacy Harmony. OS's approach. In an increasingly interconnected world, security and privacy are paramount concerns. Harmony OS addresses these concerns by incorporating robust security features throughout its architecture. The microkernel design plays a crucial role in enhancing security. By isolating different components of the system, Harmony OS minimizes the potential impact of any security breaches. If one module is compromised, the damage is contained, preventing the spread of vulnerabilities to other parts of the system. This approach, known as security by compartmentalization, is a fundamental principle of Harmony OS's security model. Harmony OS also leverages distributed security mechanisms to safeguard user data and privacy. This means that security measures are implemented at various levels of the system, from the device hardware to the operating system kernel and individual applications. This multi-layered approach makes it more difficult for attackers to exploit vulnerabilities as they need to overcome multiple security barriers to gain unauthorized access. Furthermore, Harmony OS incorporates advanced encryption and authentication technologies to protect user data. Data is encrypted both in transit and at rest, 
ensuring that it remains confidential even if intercepted or accessed without authorization. User authentication mechanisms are designed to be robust and secure, utilizing biometric authentication methods like fingerprint and facial recognition to enhance security and prevent unauthorized access to sensitive information. Section 9. Developer-Friendly Fostering App Innovation A thriving app ecosystem is essential for any operating system's success. Harmony OS recognizes this and has taken steps to make the platform developer-friendly, encouraging innovation, and attracting a wide range of applications. One of the key aspects of Harmony OS's developer-friendliness is its support for multiple programming languages. Developers can choose from popular languages like Java, JavaScript, and C++, allowing them to leverage their existing skills and code bases to create apps for Harmony OS. This flexibility lowers the barrier to entry for developers and encourages a diverse range of applications. Harmony OS also provides comprehensive development tools and resources, including integrated development environments, IDEs, software development kits, SDKs, and extensive documentation. These tools streamline the app development process, enabling developers to create, test, and deploy apps efficiently. Huawei has also established a dedicated developer community, providing forums, support channels, and training resources to assist developers in building for the Harmony OS platform. To further incentivize developers, Harmony OS offers a revenue-sharing model for app distribution. This model allows developers to monetize their apps through various channels, including in-app purchases, subscriptions, and advertising. By providing developers with a clear path to profitability, Harmony OS aims to attract a wide range of talented individuals and companies, fostering a vibrant and diverse app ecosystem that caters to the needs of its growing user base. Let's go Paula, please from Section 10. Your thoughts on Harmony, OS on PCs. Thanks, Timmy. Section 10. User Experience. Harmony OS's focus on simplicity, Harmony. OS places a strong emphasis on user experience, aiming to provide a simple, intuitive, and enjoyable interaction model. The operating system's user interface is designed with clarity and ease of navigation as top priorities. Icons are clean and easily recognizable, menus are logically structured, and interactions are designed to be intuitive. This focus on simplicity ensures that users can quickly grasp the operating system's functionality and navigate through its features without encountering unnecessary complexity. Harmony OS also emphasizes personalization, allowing users to customize their experience to suit their individual preferences. Users can personalize their home screens, choose from various themes and wallpapers, and configure system settings to tailor the operating system to their specific needs. This level of personalization empowers users to create a digital environment that feels comfortable and familiar, enhancing their overall experience with the operating system. Another key aspect of Harmony OS's user experience is its commitment to accessibility. The operating system incorporates various features designed to accommodate users with disabilities. These features include text-to-speech functionality, customizable font sizes and colors, and support for assistive input devices. By prioritizing accessibility, Harmony OS ensures that individuals with diverse needs can fully utilize the operating system's capabilities and enjoy a seamless and inclusive digital experience. Are you enjoying the video? Please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks. Let's continue. Section 11. Conclusion. A new dawn for operating systems? Harmony OS emerges as a bold contender in the ever-evolving landscape of operating systems. Its vision of a unified, interconnected ecosystem across devices holds immense potential, promising to reshape the way we interact with technology. The operating system's strengths lie in its seamless integration, robust security features, developer-friendly environment, and focus on user experience. However, Harmony OS faces significant challenges, including building a thriving app ecosystem, gaining market adoption outside of China, and navigating geopolitical complexities. The success of Harmony OS hinges on its ability to overcome these hurdles and deliver on its promises. If it can successfully attract developers, convince users of its value proposition, and expand its global reach, 
Harmony OS could usher in a new era of personal computing. You probably heard some buzz about Harmony OS. Today, I'm diving deep into how Harmony OS is revolutionizing the mobile tech scene. Let's get into it. First off, Harmony OS, developed by Huawei, has been around since 2020, but it's just now truly shaking things up. Originally designed for devices with minimal hardware requirements, Harmony OS has evolved. Fast forward to today, and we're seeing the first smartphone with this OS designed specifically for developers. That's right, a phone that's not just about calls and texts, but a robust platform for creating and testing apps. This isn't just any smartphone. It features a Unisoc P7885 chipset, 8 GB RAM, and supports 5G. That's some heavy lifting power for developers looking to innovate without lag. And with a 6.58-inch FHD display and high-quality cameras, it's clear that this device means business. But here's the kicker. It's priced at only about 200 USD. That's a steal for developers, aiming to push the boundaries of what mobile apps can do. Now, why is all this important? Harmony OS is not just another operating system. It represents a shift in how developers can interact with software and hardware. With over 5,000 top apps now ported to Harmony OS. I guess maybe some more of you have heard about Harmony OS. And um, let, me, let me start here maybe. Um, so Harmony OS is basically the operating system that's used on Huawei, smartphones, tablets, smartwatches, whatever. And... Um, it's already been in the news for a couple of years that it's a completely new operating system and uh, some of you may have read those articles and also read that it says there that uh, people checked and uh, well Android apps still work and so maybe the one or the other person wonders well what is this is it just Android relabeled and uh, so this is one of the points I'm going to try to clear up today and uh, starting here I would say that first open harmony is definitely not Android and totally unrelated. It's basically the new framework that Open Harmony or that also Harmony OS apps are based on. And um, one key point here is that you can write an app for Open Harmony and it runs on Harmony OS, but also on any other third party distributions. So basically, uh, Open Harmony is not just Harmony OS, but there are also other vendors who are uh, maintaining their own distribution, kind of like in the Linux world, there's Fedora, there's Ubuntu. Um, and in the, this case, it's mostly IoT vendors or uh, industrial vendors who keep their own uh, distribution of Open Harmony and have their special use cases for it that are entirely not smartphone related. Um, so, up until now, or let's say up until the, the end of this year, uh, Harmony OS has had an Android compatibility layer, which means Android apps actually run on it. And uh, what this also means is that basically if you uh, have an app and you're wondering, should I make it an open Harmony native app? Like uh, probably you're going to think, well, what's in it for me? And uh, since if it runs as an Android app, you're probably not going to be very motivated to port it to open Harmony. And, uh, and it's been up. So basically, at the end of this year, uh, Harmony S will move to the uh, next stage, which basically means that the Android compatibility layer will be completely removed. Um, and this means that basically only Open Harmony apps will work on uh, Harmony S phones. And I'll talk about this a bit later more, but uh, just to know, just wanted to clear up in the very beginning that uh, indeed Harmony OS is not just Android anymore, but it's uh, completely new and Android apps will not run anymore. So, um, and just don't have to worry too much about this picture. Basically, the, um, the OS features like everything you would need. So basically, you can bring your own, create your own device and uh, potentially port some drivers for it and then you would also already have all the main things you would need like a scheduler, some more AI subsystem, some logging subsystem, basically everything you would want on a, a mobile oriented uh, operating system. And one thing I just want to point out here is that there's also um, a kernel abstraction layer which means that uh, you're not or don't necessarily have Linux kernel as the basis here, but there's also a LightOS kernel and uh, on Huawei phones, maybe um, even also our, the um, Homeland kernel, which is a microkernel based uh, op, um, kernel. 
Um, so, at this point, I want to talk a bit about uh, other open harm distributions. Um, what they're focused on, so there are very different areas. Most of them are kind of like just starting up now because Open Harmony has not been around for that long. But uh, there's, there's a lot of um, third-party vendors who are basically creating their own distributions, and some of those uh, are in the mining area, some of them are in the finance area. Uh, there's a project which is focused on bringing Harmony to the classroom and having some educational apps running on it. And there are also some government uh, terminals, for example, like uh, with some face scanning to uh, when, you, when you enter a building, uh, or um, like uh, smart, smart door controls, etc. And um, th so I just want to show the slide to kind of show that it's not just uh, a Huawei project, but there are also um, many third-party vendors who are interested in bringing their own distribution of this. And um, this is currently mostly with a China focus because all these vendors are mostly China, but in Europe we also have the Oneiro Foundation, which is um, together with the Eclipse Foundation um, and the Open Atom Foundation. They're basically working on bringing this Oneiro OS, which is a, a distribution which is more catered to the European or Western market. And I think there will be a talk about this later today. Um, so, I already mentioned that the AOSP compatibility layer will be completely removed and Harmony was next. And uh, there has already been basically a developer preview of this for select invited uh, um, developers. We're currently only open to Chinese developers since the uh, end of last year. And um, basically, you now have to use the new RQI framework, which is based on uh, TypeScript, or like a fork of TypeScript. I'll come a bit later to what the differences are. It's, um, and it basically means you actually have to rewrite your apps in RQI or ArcTS. And of course, uh, this is an important key point for the um, whole project because um, if you actually ship a phone with Harmony OS Next, then you would expect that their, your favorite apps are there, right? And uh, one key point is here that um, there's a huge effort going on in China right now to actually port the at least top 5,000 apps. Uh, to open Harmony OS, and uh, hopefully this will also bring apart a larger um, library ecosystem which helps creating new apps. So one other key feature of Harmony OS Next is also that there is uh, actually a custom kernel, so it's not even running Linux underneath anymore, but still it's completely compatible because there is a compatibility layer, so that basically means uh, it's, uh, if your app runs for Linux with a muzzle-based libc, it will also, uh, it should run on the custom kernel. There are some minor restrictions, some C APIs which are explicitly not uh, made available for various concerns, but I'll come to that a bit later. And uh, yeah, so, but just want to mention, so Harmony is next. Um, the target audience in the first rollout this year will first be Chinese mainland, and I wouldn't expect it to see it on a the remaining um, European or Western phones just yet. So, oh, oh, I actually did not click through, sorry. <coughs> um, yeah, so I already mentioned um, we're the top 5,000 apps are in the process of being, being ported, and this is basically because uh, Huawei did some research and saw that 99% of the time of Huawei phone users spent in 5,000 apps, which is quite significant. And so there's currently a huge porting effort going on with already 4,000 of the top 5,000 apps being, being ported or, um, or already being ported. And uh, the remaining 1,000, there are also currently discussions ongoing with the developers uh, on uh, making it happen. So of course this is a huge effort and uh, Huawei is spending, is helping out the developers to get it ported. Um, one key thing here I think is also to mention that one difference is that in China the so-called mini apps are very popular, which basically means if you have uh, um, WeChat and maybe Alipay and with, with their mini apps or Mate One, um, then basically these mini apps make already a lot of uh, apps available just because you have this one super app and in it you have all the mini apps uh, just automatically available if you have uh, the uh, WeChat basically. And uh, yeah, 
One, one thing that makes porting maybe a bit nicer is that uh, TypeScript is a language that probably many web developers are already very familiar with. And um, I'll come to why ArcTS or the flavor of TypeScript that we're using maybe makes it a bit of an even nicer language. So uh, let me talk about, um, so I want to talk a bit about how developing for Open Harmony actually looks like. And of course, there's an official ID which is basically also based on the JetBrains IDE, which is similar to Android Studio. And currently the latest release is version 4.1 and it's available from the uh, official release notes. Although um, the English release notes don't uh, list the download link yet, so I just uh, put the Chinese release notes here and made a screenshot so you can easily find which place you have to click. <laughs> So basically, um, if you scroll down to the right section, you will see that there's a link for Windows, Mac, and uh, Mac ARM. And uh, that's where you can download the SDK and the developer, uh, the ID. Um, some nice features include that uh, debuggers, of course, included hot reloading, there's a UI previewer, there's an emulator, and profiling tracing are all directly included. Um, one thing that's still missing is, of course, that the Rust plugin, oh, I made a typo here, sorry, that the Rust plugin is missing. Um, and if many of you have maybe used the Sea Lion or um, Rust Rover from JetBrains, they have a very nice Rust plugin. But uh, yeah, since Rust is currently not officially supported, uh, the Rust plugin is missing, and uh, hopefully that will, can be added at a later point. So. Maybe just to manage expectations. The Harmony OS Next SDK, as I already mentioned, it's still kind of in developer preview. So once you download it, you can't actually test on your, if you have a Huawei phone, you can't actually test for the, if the new version runs because you don't have access to the SDKs yet. But uh, on the other hand, the Open Harmony situation is already much better because the 4.1 SDK is freely available to everybody, even outside China, and it can be installed automatically. Um, if you want to develop, develop native code, which could be C, C++, or also REST, um, then you should also additionally select the native code, which will install LVM tool chains, etc., so that you can compile. Uh, yeah. And I think uh, here I'll just quickly show you how, to, how, the, how it looks like if you were to create a project. So basically, you start with a boilerplate uh, project. Um, in our case, we select native C++. We later want to look at uh, Rust code, but um, well, there is no uh, template for that yet. And uh, basically, once you have uh, generated the project, you get a lot of files. So it's not really that that's what the minimum setup kind of looks like. And I'll explain kind of later what all of this is. And one thing I just want to mention here is that um, in the so-called uh, build profile file, you can basically switch between the runtime OS, which could be either Harmony OS or Open Harmony. Um, this affects the signing of the bundle. I'll kind of later talk about why, what signing is and why this might be relevant at a slightly later point. And, um, oh yeah, already here. So, in theory, Open Harmony apps can run on all Open Harmony devices. But, and here comes the but. For security reasons, like apps must be signed just because you kind of want to know who's the developer, is the package still the same as when it was signed? And uh, of course, this means that um, which signature do we trust? What's the, our root of source? And uh, um, of course, this depends on the open harmony distribution because we can't have one size fits all. If you, you um, like for Harmony OS, of course, uh, it's a Huawei system, so you would have to trust, so, uh, you would trust who Huawei trusts. If you have your own distribution, you would probably want to choose yourself as the vendor who you want to trust. So this basically means uh, you compile your application, your Open Harmony application once, but then in the end for supporting different uh, distributions of Open Harmony, you would likely have to re-sign it uh, for different applications, for different operating systems. And um, if you're just developing and, for example, your distribution is kind of like a, vendor, a system for um, a development board, then likely this option is just turned off and you can just uh, flash away and you don't have to worry about this. But um, in the other cases, you would have to follow the signing process and uh, this depends on, on, your on the vendor, as uh, I already said. But if you're 
um, targeting harmonious, then actually this is, you don't have to care about this too much. Uh, the signing keys are basically automatically generated in the Dev Echo Studio ID uh, as long as you sign in and um, yeah. For Open Harmony, again, this kind of, uh, you have to manually generate the keys because it's a process that depends on which distribution exactly you're, you're developing for. So let me just talk a bit about what an Open Harmony app looks like. Um, this is the uh, it's a new new stage model. There's also an older model of apps available in the APIs, uh, but that's uh, not recommended anymore and uh, deprecated. So I'll just talk about the stage model. Basically, in the end, what we're going to ship is a whole app, um, and this can hold multiple or at least one uh, HAP. And in most cases, it is just going to be one HAP. So that's currently we're going to just assume you have one HAP. Uh, one HAP has basically one or more one ability stage, and uh, this can hold uh, multiple UI abilities or extension abilities. Extension abilities are things without a UI, but maybe you want to keep it separate in a different thread or whatever, different process. And UI abilities um, basically are. If you have on a phone, base, um, in the Recents tab, you can see if, if you want your, your app to appear as different apps in the Recents tab, then you would have multiple UI abilities. Most of the time you don't want that, then you just have one UI ability, but with multiple windows, uh, with multiple Arc UI pages, basically. So one window can lo have switched between different pages, and this would be our, our setup. So in the following, we're basically going to assume we have one UI ability, and uh, probably multiple pages. And um, just what to expect when developing an app, um, there like, there's a lot of uh, metadata files. Um, some generic metadata is in the app.json file file, there's a package manifest, there's a build profile file where you declare your models, and uh, then this is the, so then you have the actual module folders. Uh, most, most of the time you have just one, and by default it's called entry. And the model looks like this. So basically, you again have a package declaration file, you again have a build profile, and you have again this uh, build script called hvigor file, where you can uh, write your build script in TypeScript, if you like that. And then the important thing here is down below in your module, you have uh, again a JSON5 file for the module description, some resources where you can have your strings in different languages uh, for translating them. And the important part is in the ETS, you have your TypeScript files, in the CPP, CPP you have your potentially native code. Um, don't try to rename it. I tried renaming it to native because I was using Rust and I thought CPP sounds so C++-like, but uh, that broke the build system. <laughs> um, yeah, let me first talk about the ETS folder. It basically contains the abilities and pages of a module and Commonly, you have like one UI ability, and uh, this is written in ArcGIS. And optionally, you additionally have a C++ code, which is built by CMake. Um, so if you do have native code with CMake, then you also have to additionally declare those types in an, uh, what, what they are, in, uh, like in the JavaScript TypeScript world. And uh, currently, you have to keep those manually in sync. And ArcGIS can import those. So let me just talk about ArcTS now, because um, that might be interesting. It's uh, basically a stricter TypeScript flavor, and the goals are that it should be easy to read, it should be performant and efficient, and it should prevent common errors. So let me show you. Here we have some TypeScript. This is a regular TypeScript. We have a class person. It has a string in it. But this is TypeScript, so actually it doesn't have to be a string. It could also be undefined. This is also what we see here in line uh, 13. We make new person. And, uh, well, name is not set. Then we do body.getName, and uh, this will throw an exception because, uh, well, there is no name. It's undefined. Uh, now in RTS, you force the initialization, which is probably not a new concept for most of you. And uh, then that basically means that uh, down in line 15, you don't get an error because uh, name is just an empty string, and that's fine although probably also not what you want. And um, the other option in ArcTS is that you use this uh, optional 
question mark that it can where it explicitly kind of say it's a string or undefined, and then that also forces you down below in line 16. Uh, if you just use get name, you will get a compile time error because it's not initialized, and um, otherwise you would have to use the question mark operator to uh, propagate the error. And um, these are the common types of uh, optimizations that have been added to ArcTS, basically that you force all types to be known at compile time. Stuff like any unknown types are just forbidden, and the object layout cannot be changed at runtime. This also means that projects that follow the best TypeScript practices can keep a, a large part of the code base intact, uh, and it allows the compiler to do many additional optimizations just because it, uh, it knows exactly what the types are, and uh, it doesn't have to do any runtime checks if something is undefined. No, where did my mouse go? Yeah, I also kept here some links for further reading if you're interested in this. Um, now, the second part of ArcTS is actually the ArcUI specific additions, uh, because actually you probably want to build a UI. And uh, this is all pretty simple and easy to understand. So here's a small example uh, where you kind of have a text box and uh, if you click the button, it changes the text of the text box. And uh, I don't want to talk too much about this, but um, basically you have ArcTS adds additional built-in components, um, like there's a built-in column type, there's a built-in text type, divider, there's some uh, decorators which you can put, and then you can compose different uh, objects into it so you can get a composable UI. Um, just a quick point here, so what we just saw was a page, and this is loaded from the page ability that I talked about shortly earlier, and in my, most cases, probably you would just have here a simple, when the window stage is created, then you load a content, which is just a page, and uh, additionally, maybe in a real app, you would want to, if it goes to the background, or if it goes to the foreground, you want to save some state, restore some state, maybe, or uh, those are all things that you can do, but uh, in my cases, I skipped all of that. So, um, here we have a small example page. Uh, this is just a minimal ArcTS app, and it does some addition. So, currently, this addition is implemented in TypeScript, and basically what it does is you have uh, this, this text box, and if you click on it, uh, then it increments the number and uh, the text gets updated. And uh, now, we have this idea, oh, this add operation, we just assume it's very expensive, we want to do the native code. I mean, this is of course completely stupid because the call overhead to calling to native op overhead is much larger than a simple addition would ever be, but let's just go for the example so that I can show you how it would look like. So basically the code doesn't change much, just in the first line you would uh, add an additional import statement where you import uh, something from uh, libentry.so, which is basically just uh, and then you can use any function that's defined in this uh, shared object. In this case, we define the add function in the object. And uh, then you can just call that instead of the native TypeScript function. Now let's look at how the C++ code looks like that we have to implement to get this add function. Uh, and one thing that you will notice is that there's kind of a lot of boilerplate. Uh, um, if you ever used a uh, Node API, this will look very familiar, except that um, this is kind of like the way you write it without any macros to simplify it. You have some function which is your raw CFFI, or here, no, here you first have the constructor which is used to register the function at all. Uh, then this is the actual add function where you don't really get your parameters directly, but you get an environment variable, not, not the env. And then you can extract the actual arguments, which makes up most of the function. And the actual addition is down in line 24, where you have a nappy create double, and then inside there you have value 0 plus value 1. So, as you can see, that's actually quite a lot of boilerplate, um, which you can simplify a bit by macros and C++, of course, but I just wanted to show how it looks like. So, this is only useful if you actually have something expensive to do. If it's just like a simple add, you probably wouldn't do this. But our later example will be server, so there's actually a lot of uh, uh, stuff going on in the native code. 
And of course, you also have to deploy your type for the JavaScript. And uh, one thing that has to be kept in mind is that these have to be kept in sync. Otherwise, Babel is, of course, a bit uh, undefined. Now, on the Rust side, of course, uh, there's always macros, which can help. And proc macros are very helpful for this because they can abstract away a lot of way. There's a, there already the existing NAPIRS crate, which is basically a framework for pre-compiled Node.js add-ons in Rust. And with a couple of modifications, we can get this to work for Open Harmony. It's uh, not a lot, but it's, um, we, we also haven't tried merging it upstream yet. And it's currently a community-maintained fork. Uh, I don't really have any official affiliation with it. Um, yeah, and it's currently, in, I would say, in a very early stages of development, but uh, it actually works quite fine. And this helps us to significantly reduce the boilerplate, and actually we can add it quite easily to our um, project. Now, um, how can we actually integrate the Rust library that we've built? So basically, one the, the easiest way is uh, we can just pre-build it manually and place it under a special kind of path where the idea will look. And you could then set up your IDE to call cargo build and copy it. I mean, it's not really my favorite approach, but it works. You could write a plugin to the HVigo build system in TypeScript. I didn't try that yet, but it's definitely possible. Or um, since we know that C, C++ code is built with CMake and that works, we could also use perhaps corrosion. Now, um, as already was mentioned, I actually maintain the corrosion CMake model. It works. Um, quite well on Windows, Linux, Mac, and it kind of basically it looks at cargo metadata and then automatically imports any any uh, crates that have uh, are either static libraries or dynamic libra CDY libs uh, with a CFFI, and um, this works quite well. Usually, it sets automatically the correct linker and the REST compiler target, so it's um, and it does a lot of more stuff under the hood for you. Well, now, one, one thing that makes it a bit more complicated is that the Open Harmony SDK ships a pre-built Scenic version, which is rather old, and that's kind of missing a required feature, which is to move the, uh, w or which corrosion uses, and which would be to, to move the library to a place where you install during the build. Now, of course, you could backport this to the older corrosion version, but that would also be a lot of work. Other than the other alternative is to use uh, upstream Scenic. Um, but that also doesn't work quite out of the box. You basically have to copy one file from the um, shipped CMake version to the upstream CMake version, and then it actually seems to work just fine. But uh, in conclusion, currently it's, uh, there's the, the best or most reliable way is to actually add a build script to your IDE or whatever, and that you can just uh, copy it to the uh, hard-coded library path. Um, yeah, so let me just speed up a bit here. So we have um, first example that I want to show is basically actually compile something useful, which would be like rip grep. It's like a simple command line application um, in Rust. And um, so we just try to compile it. There's this uh, tier two target, AR64 unknown Linux OHOS, which is um, now shipped as a tier two target in since Rust 1.78, which just came out a couple of days ago. And uh, well, of course, it doesn't just work out of the box. You first have to add the target. Well, that's easy enough, probably. And um, next step is that linking fails. Uh, we see, look at the error, and we see, oh, it uses user bin LD. That doesn't look right. So we actually have to specify the linker. Um, and uh, once we specify the linker explicitly via a magic environment variable, uh, I'll come to that a bit later, we can just, uh, it compiles. We flash it onto the phone, and we check and it actually works just fine. Uh, I also did some more tests if it actually grepping works, but uh, I didn't include a screenshot of that because I wasn't sure if maybe some sensitive data wasn't there or not. Sorry. <laughs> uh, now, what are finally to the main stage, um, we, with grep is maybe not that interesting. What about something a bit bigger? Now, in this example, I'll be talking about the server. Um, it's a rendering engine written in Rust. The main server components uh, measured about uh, 240k lines of Rust code. I measured that with um, SCC. And uh, that's not amazingly much, but it also has a lot of dependencies. So if you look at uh, the dependency list, it has over 700 plus Rust and C++ dependencies. And then I just tried to use Cargo Vendor 
and count how many lines it is. So in this case, I basically did Cargo Vendor, removed all these Windows crates, Win API windows and NDK crates, which brought the line count down by about half. And uh, we see we have about 4 million lines of Rust code and uh, over a million lines of C and C++ code each, which uh, is quite a lot. Now, our hope is, of course, that this will just work out of the box. And uh, one challenge here is, of course, that there are multiple build systems involved, the CRS, CMake, AutoTools. Uh, so we'll see in a moment how that works. Um, the good thing here is that on the UI side, well, for a browser app, you actually don't need that much. You need kind of like the browser window where you see the window, and you need an URL bar. Everything else is kind of like not so important, you could say. You don't need a back button. You don't need a forward button. You can skip that for a demo. Um, so maybe as a step how to, how to get an estimation how much work is actually needed to create an app or to port an app, um, we follow some simple steps. So first we just kind of create a dummy library that depends on libserver, which exposed all the libraries. And we fix all the compilation and linking errors. And um, so step one here is kind of like figure out all the environment variables which are needed for building the C, C++ dependencies because you have to set, set stuff like the C compiler, the C++ compiler, the linker, PKG, PKG config, and all that other stuff. And uh, step two would be then to do the same for like the Rust dependencies, um, which are failing to build. So one thing that, that came up here is that um, often actually the issues were already fixed by the community members. Great. You know, like it was often something like in Nix or in libc where some uh, functions were missing. And uh, all you have to do is update the dependency. Sounds easy, right? But of course, uh, as it turns out, updating long dependency chains can be quite time consuming. Uh, I didn't actually have to do all of that. There are also other people who have to do update dependencies from time to time. So a lot of the time was just me waiting on the actual pull request uh, that somebody else was working on to go forward. But of course, since the dependency chains can be quite deep in such a large project, it just takes a lot of time until the bump from a project like five levels down gets propagated all the way up because in the end, sometimes you have to actually update versions uh, in sync because uh, you don't really want to have different versions of the same crate multiple times in your uh, project. Yeah, but since we kind of like want to actually make progress and not wait three months, uh, sometimes you can just kind of like backport an OHOS, like, like a fix to an, to an older version of a crate and then use the patching of, of cargo as a quick bandit solution so that you don't have to update all the other stuff which is completely unrelated to what you actually wanted to do. And the final thing is that sometimes you actually have stuff which needs to be implemented differently for Open Army. Like, uh, what is the window in Open Army? How large is it? And uh, well, as a first step, you just guess, you know, stub it, write an unimplemented or to do, and uh, this will fix the compilation error, but of course it will fail later at runtime. But first, we kind of want to find out uh, how much work is it at all. Now, once you have all the compilation issues fixed, you can move on to the linking issues. And often there, the, the fixes just build the library from source. Like, it's not available as a client library uh, on the system, but you can, of course, build it from source and then you know, the linking issue goes away because it's uh, there. And sometimes it's also just that wrong dependencies get linked in. So uh, one, one thing to hear was that, uh, well, open harming targets, the target OS is Linux. So some crates just assume, well, X11 or Wayland must be there, but it's not. So then you have to go and fix it. So <laughs> yeah. Um, now after that step, or oh, this one I'm going to skip over. Um, it's basically just a list of magic environment wrappers here and on the next page. Just one thing I want to mention is that if you use BindGen, you should really have a look on both setting lib clang path and clang path, both of them. Otherwise, you'll probably run into a BindGen issue, potentially depending on how many clang versions you have, where one part of BindGen loads the most recent version of clang and a different version loads the default version of clang. And if those aren't the same, then you can have like weird errors. Like ideally your compilation fails and you notice, otherwise you might have uh, other issues popping up. Um, it took me a while to figure this out because I took, yeah. And um, yeah, let's get to all that, sounds interesting. So now 
we have it compiled, everything links, we can flash it on a device. But of course in step one we fix a lot of issues just by writing to do. That means of course it will panic when we hit those. Uh, so the first step is, uh, so the first step is kind of like uh, fixing those parts as we hit them. Um, but we don't actually have to fix everything at the beginning, right? We can just hard code some values like uh, y, d, uh, and uh, this helps in surprisingly many um, cases, but not in all cases. Like I tried hard coding the window size, but I didn't know the actual window size, so I just uh, wrote 100, 100, and thought maybe it would just render to a small surface, but no, it just crashed. <laughs> so, so it can work and it saves you some time, but uh, not in all cases. Um, so sometimes you actually do ha have to do it properly. Um, from this point, I just want to shortly want to talk about the ArcUX component. This is basically what is used on OpenHarmony to render to a native window. And uh, now in the simplest case, you just create one X component and then you can natively render to that. Um, on the native code, which you see down at the bottom, you basically get a no mangle C function, which has called on surface created. And this gets called when the surface is actually created. And this is then our entry point into servo. First step is actually getting logging working because if logging doesn't work, then you also don't see any panic messages and it's kind of hard to debug anything. Um, and actually, once we hit this phase and logging was working, um, there was only like very minor changes needed. So basically just during the graphics initialization phase where you had to set the window size, um, set up the EGL, there were some minor changes required. Um, most of it could just be uh, done very quickly. And after that, server loaded and rendered actually just fine on the first try. Like uh, that was, I was, astounded. But of course, uh, it doesn't really stop there. Um, this was simple demo and uh, touchscreen support was, for example, not there just because I was not listening for any touch events. So, I mean, then you have a browser, but you can't scroll or anything. So that's kind of like not so impressive. Now, um, can I actually move this to the other screen? Oh, yeah, I can. So I just want to show that it actually works. This is my phone mirrored, and um, it looks kind of laggy here on the big screen, but on the phone it looks more fluid, so feel free to try it out later. I mean, it's still uh, one thing that is different here compared to, or like still missing is uh, Fling support. I don't know how many of you know what Fling is, but basically if you scroll on your app and you lift up your finger, then you expect it kind of to go on scrolling. but. Uh, there is like no native API for that yet, and basically you just have the raw events. So if you lift up your finger, you will get no touch events anymore. And since we don't, since I don't keep track yet of it of the of the history, don't calculate the velocity or anything, it basically means the window stops moving immediately, which is uh, not how you want a browser to be. But you know, for demo purposes, it's just fine right now. Um, now, how do I move it back? How do I close the window now? Okay. Yeah, so there are some minor things that are not working it, which is mostly WebGL support. I just disabled it because it led to it crashing because I didn't implement uh, the part yet where you have an off-screen buffer. Flink support is missing and actually calling back to the ArcTS. Oh, um, ArcGIST UI is not working yet, so basically if you click on a link, it will not update the link and you can't, and it won't uh, go to the new website. But those are all minor changes, and I hope to uh, fix that and also upstream the changes to the main server repository. If you want to have a look at the sources, I put a link in here to both the uh, ArcGIS app and the my branch of uh, server, so that you can have a look uh, at the changes required if you're interested. Uh, just be aware that it's not production-ready code and there are kind of parts where code is commented, copy, pasted, and uh, yeah, so it's not beautiful to look at. Now, just a summary of what the changes that were required. Um, the Arc UI to server layer was actually uh, incredibly easy, uh, also because of the trade system, so you just have to implement some trades for the callback, and you can also just implement those as no ops and leave it for later. Um, the specific window initialization was a bit more challenging uh, 
The documentation there could also be slightly improved, in my opinion. In general, the documentation for Open Harmony US is quite good. Um, but here in this part, I felt that it could be slightly improved. Um, yeah, font loading had to be adapted um, because fonts are handled differently on, on Open Harmony as compared to um, compared to both Android and Linux. So currently, I just actually hard coded a font. Luckily, Harmony OS uses or Open Harmony uses a Huawei Harmony OS font, and that supports uh, I think 100 languages they claim. And uh, so that works quite well for most cases. And um, getting the rest running um, is on my to-do list. So uh, yeah, environment variables, figuring those out took a bit of time. And of course, once I got running on Linux, I also tried on my Mac. But uh, it didn't work, of course. And I had to do some uh, adaptations for, for Mac just because things were a bit different to get the get it compiling there. Um, and yeah, the other thing was creating uh, Rust bindings for some Open Harmony APIs, but uh, we have nice tools there like BindGen, which can gener generate a lot of the code. And then the main thing is kind of like to create a safe layer on top of that, and uh, that's also currently in progress. Main thing here is the logging system HiLog and the tracing system HiTrace, which is needed so that you can in integrate into the profiling system of the ID, and you can kind of see where is time spent, how can we optimize it. So, yeah, in general, Rust on Open Harmony is actually quite well supported. It's now a tier two target. Uh, there's still some manual work involved. It's similar to Android. You have to download an SDK. Uh, the standard library is pre-built. You can just add it via Rust up target add. You currently still have to set the linker, linker manual via this variable cargo target and then the target and linker. Um, I hope that in the future this can be set automatically since technically we, should, we actually know what the linker should be if we know the C compiler. And yeah, cross-compiling works surprisingly well. I mean, I mentioned already server was a huge project. It had one or three mile, million lines of code, C++, and then same amount of C code. And compared to that, the time I spent fixing stuff, uh, I mean, for C code, it was only setting magic environment variables. And for Rust code, it was also not much. Um, yeah, so this is kind of like, if you, if you have those magic environment, environment variables, then it's, uh, it actually just works. Um, in some cases, like there are some build systems which try to detect the target and be smart. And if they detect something they don't know, like the target called OHOS, well, they just fail. And of course, that has to be patched. Uh, you don't get around that. But luckily, those are a small minority of uh, projects. Now, uh, future work. I hope that we can make a Rust really like a first class citizen for Open Harmony code. Um, get the macros working, uh, merge upstream, um, make more bindings so that you can access all the Open Harmony APIs in a safe way. Uh, one important thing is definitely getting a reusable GitHub CI action so that you can tell people here, here's a CI action. It actually builds for Open Harmony. It runs in QMO. Uh, you, can, you can test it yourself. You don't have to trust me. Um, and another thing I would like to explore in the future is basically uh, integrating async runtimes like Tokyo uh, with the function flow runtime kit, which is used for C++ um, coroutine based scheduling on Open Harmony, because currently you have a situation where you have like both runtimes there, and that kind of means you have double the threads, and it's just waste resources. So ideally, we would only have just one of those. Um, we'll see how we, how we can explore that in the future. So. Sorry, I went a bit over time. Uh, I'm happy for any questions. And, okay, thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Let's take uh, one or two questions from the audience. Any questions for Jonathan? <clears throat> so how easy is it to get Open Harmony running on a VM or something so I can test things locally? So um, that's a good question, actually. Um, I haven't tested this myself too much because I usually use the Harmony OS emulator, which ships with the, uh, since I actually have access to the new Harmony OS SDK. Supposedly, um, it runs very well in QMO. Uh, at least that's what uh, people from Shanghai University have told me because they are not employed at Huawei. They don't have access to it, but uh, they are, they're using it just fine on QMO. And um, I'm hoping I will actually get the instructions from them how to, how to use it because uh, they, they <laughs> 
uh, as someone who's working in Huawei, I often only know like uh, the, the harmonious way, and it's uh, sometimes hard to figure out the way how it's meant for people who, who don't have access to the uh, harmonious specific stuff. So, uh, but at least they told me it, it runs fine, Kiemo, and uh, I'm hoping to get instructions, and I would also be happy to share it, and uh, that will be part of the thing that will be uh, put into a reusable GitHub CI action, basically. So, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? So, um, is there any way to do native UI, uh, like apart from the ArcGIS uh, framework, or is there is it only possible to do it via ArcGIS? So. I'm not 100% sure here. So I think currently the, the first class citizen is definitely ArcGIS and ArcUI. Of course, you can do rendering via OpenGL or Vulkan for, for like an X component. Uh, when I asked, I was told that it is also possible to create a, like an app without any ArcGIS, but I, when I asked the follow-up question, I, I didn't receive an answer yet because there has been vacation basically for the last five days. And uh, so I hope I'll get some answers there, but uh, it, it might be possible. And I'm also very interested in this, actually. Yeah. So what does the future hold for Harmony OS? In the short term, we can expect to see more and more devices start to run the operating system. In the long term, we can expect to see a fundamental shift in the way we use our devices. Harmony OS is changing the PC landscape right now, and it's only going to get better from here. So what do you think about Harmony OS? Leave your thoughts in the comments below and be sure to check out my other videos for more tech insights.